Hi, and welcome to The Working Songwriter, the show where today's best songwriters come to talk shop. I'm your host, Joe Pug. Each episode here, we host a distinguished guest, and we ask them to go deep on their inspiration, on their process, on the general ups and downs of making a life in music. So whether you're a grizzled veteran, developing the songwriting software that will eventually replace us all, or else, a scrappy upstart. Listening to family members thoughtfully ask whether you've ever thought of playing Saturday Night Live or not. This is your show, because ultimately, it is what every writer seeks most. An ironclad excuse to put off actually writing. Hey everybody. It's the last Friday of February 2017. I'd like to thank everyone who came out to the Boot and Saddle in Philadelphia last week and to City Winery in New York City and to the show in Baltimore. Also, I'd like to thank American Aquarium for hosting me at their Road Trip to Raleigh concert slash mini festival uh, last month. In particular, it's really nice uh, that Will Hogue and his band were on the same bill. I opened for Will almost seven or eight years ago at the old Southgate House in Newport, Kentucky. Loved his voice and his tunes and have followed him ever since, but hadn't seen his live show in a very long time. So uh, thanks to BJ and the whole crew for putting that show together. If you'd like to hear some of my songs live in concert, here's where I'll be in the near future. March 2nd in Houston at the Mucky Duck. March 18th at the Anastasia Music Festival in St. Augustine, Florida. March 29th in San Antonio at Sam's Burger Joint. April 20th in Washington, D.C. at the Hamilton. April 21st in Brooklyn at the Knitting Factory. April 27th in Fort Collins, Colorado at the Downtown Artery. April 28th in Lyons, Colorado at the Wildflower Pavilion. April 29th, Colorado Springs, the Ivy Wild School, the 30th in Denver at the Bluebird, May 11th in Austin at Antones. All of those Colorado shows, by the way, will be with Anais Mitchell, a former guest of this show and one of my absolute favorite performers to share a bill with. So don't miss those if you're local. If you enjoy this podcast, if you'd like to help it remain a viable endeavor for me, There are a couple quick, entirely painless, entirely free things you can do to help out. First, you can rate the show from within your podcast app. Just open the app, click the search button, type the name of the show, click on the reviews button. That's it. It's really easy. You could probably do it before today's interview with Tim even begins. So please take that 15, 20 seconds and help me out. The second thing that you can do... Um, this is just as important, if not more important, is to simply tell a like-minded friend about the show. You could do that from the podcast app by clicking on the share button or texting a friend, or you could just go old school, talk to somebody, mention the show, tell them to jump on it. In the last few months that I've asked for your help in this way, we've seen a real spike in listenership, and you're the reason why. Uh, that's going to help me to continue producing this show every month, so thanks for taking the opportunity to do that so far, and I really hope that you continue. It's it's immensely helpful. If there's anyone that you want to hear on this show, if you have suggestions, critiques, compliments, please drop a line to the working songwriter at gmail.com. Several of the show's guests have already been uh, recommendations from listeners, um, so let me know what you're thinking. Uh, unless you're going to suggest yourself as a guest, uh, please at least have the decency to create like a proxy email address and do so via pseudonym. Okay, that's all the business I have for you this month. Thanks for being here, and I really hope you enjoy this month's chat. My guest this month is Timothy Showalter, the creative force behind Philadelphia's Strand of Oaks. 
Born in 1982 in Goshen, Indiana, a town of about 30,000, just north of Fort Wayne, his family ran the local GM dealership, and he grew up the second of three brothers. He attended college briefly at Eastern University in Philadelphia before returning home to marry a high school sweetheart. The abrupt ending of that engagement spurred a relocation to Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. There, in an attempt to get back on his feet, he immersed himself in music, only to have the house he was renting burned down in a catastrophic fire shortly thereafter. These crises would become the creative focus of Leave Ruin, his debut album in 2009. In the ensuing five years, he would self-release two albums and tour relentlessly, earning the attention of Dead Oceans, an Austin, Texas label with a sterling roster that includes The Dirty Projectors, Phosphorescent, and The Tallest Man on Earth. His eventual signing with them would hold particular significance for him as Dead Oceans is in partnership with Secretly Canadian, the label which was home to his late songwriting hero, Jason Molina. His first album with them, Heal, would become his most successful to date. It was recognized in year-end lists by NPR, American Songwriter, and the AV Club. It also garnered him appearances at Bonnaroo, Lollapalooza, and Late Night with Seth Meyers. Consequence of Sound has said that his writing voice possesses an inner fearlessness. Pitchfork has noted that his horizons are limited only by his fantastical imagination. Tim just released his latest album, Hard Love, last week, and he's been busy preparing for a tour to support it. But, lucky for us, he was able to carve out about an hour to talk about his journey. Hello. Very punctual. Just... Wow. Just... Always here. Always here. (laughs) Just in the first 30 seconds of the one o'clock minute, the call's coming yep. in. Yep. Yep. Actually, a little late for me. I usually prefer the five minutes before. I uh, <laughs> just, again, turn evokes the uh, wonderful reputation of the hardest partying and also earliest band in the uh, rock and roll world right now. So, like, <laughs> that's the way to be. Well, that's how you can afford yourself the rope to continue partying. Because if you start showing up late, people start telling you to quit. <laughs> I mean, we were in the grips of everything known to man, and we were 15 minutes early to a shuttle and uh, on some festival, and the, and the person doing the shuttle was like, how are you guys early compared to everyone else? We just like being on time. We That's, love it. It's one of life's great pleasures. <laughs> it is. Oh, my God. Well, dude, I want to let you know that having known you for a long time and followed your career, just as a friend, reading all the interviews and listening to all the interviews that you've done, that I'm like very well versed in your in your interview strategies uh, and well equipped <laughs> to counter. And your main your main move in an interview is to slowly but imperceptibly throughout the course of it to kind of deflect all attention and approbation onto the interviewer instead of yourself while you just kind of quietly slip off into the night. So <laughs> I, I'm thinking this has something to do deep down with like some like kind of deep Midwestern Mennonite reserve and guilt. Uh, but uh, you're not going to, it's not going to fly here today. And we're going to keep all things laser beam focused on Strand of Oaks and Tim Walter. Okay. I was planning on making this the Joe Pug appreciation hour. So, yeah. I mean, that was, that it's was my intention. It's exactly what we're going to avoid. So uh, there's there's three places that I can count that have shaped you as a person and you as an artist, and I want to talk about all three. First, I want to talk about Goshen and Wilkes-Barre, and then later on in the show, I want to talk about Philadelphia in depth. Tell me about growing up in small-town Indiana. Um, did you always feel like a rock and roll pirate, or were you... <laughs> more into like typical pursuits for a kid at that time. I, I it was it was a pretty uh singular moment in my life that it went from being a normal kid to uh whatever path I'm on now and it was 
simply based on uh, when I was in seventh grade or eighth grade. I was I was pretty good at basketball. I was left-handed, so I got like six six points on everybody until they found out that I was left-handed. And, you know, I was like I, I was a pretty I had a pretty good shot, but I was uh, and I was this size with a beard in seventh grade. So it was uh, you know I was I, for that brief moment window I was. The biggest kid. You were the post uh, player. Yeah, <laughs> six yeah, feet tall. I was, I was a power yeah. forward. It was insane, yeah. and a uh, or center even. And but what happened was I was like seventh grade playing all these sports, and my ankles started like hurting terribly. Mm-hmm. And then my knees started hurting, and then my fingers started hurting, and then it turned into my ankle couldn't move, and then my knees couldn't move, and then my fingers like stopped. Were, they froze, my Jesus. joints froze, and we did all this, you know, we went to the doctors, and they didn't know what was going on. A lot of them just said I was complaining and mm-hmm. being typical, you know, like, toughen up kind right. of mentality, only to find out after, like, a half a year of this that I had, like, a very advanced form of uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Oh, as Jesus. A, as a, it's something that happens when you, it's juvenile rheumatoid, so when you turn... You know, when you go through puberty, your joints are starting to grow, and then it, you know, it was getting so bad that it was about to affect my organ, like my... Oh, my God. It was was my, you know, my liver was starting to, like, freeze, and, like, you can get rheumatoid in your organs as well, but... So, I, you know, went from being pretty good at basketball throughout the course of the year, being demoted to the water boy, because (laughs) I couldn't, I couldn't play anymore, and... What happened then is I, you know, that was right around the time when I was starting to listen to more music and discovering older brothers, you know, friends, older brothers records and, you know, like the Smiths and what happens when you're that age. And then on top of it, I had this like pretty bad disease. So I was, and it was, I was medicated really quickly on a, on a series of prescriptions that were all uh, subsequently you know, when it, like Viox, Arthrotech, and another one that, like, I could have, there was class action lawsuits filed against. Like, I was, like, incre- I was opiate, I was on fucking opiate at, you know, seventh grade. And so, I, and then it caused severe depression on top of that. And so I went into this tailspin that you already do when you become a teenager. And I no longer could play sport and, I remember specifically uh, one of my friends, Adam, he was in drama club. Mm-hmm. And I, uh, I went from being in the basketball then to that spring drama club. I didn't have to be as athletic and move around as much. So I, I then joined a improv troupe. Mm-hmm. I was in seventh grade. And that, that kind of like awoken, you know, in a, in a family, you know, I love my family very much, but there wasn't a lot of, like, artists in my family. There, I, there was zero artists in my family. You know, for, I don't even think in generations there was ever, like, a person that pursued the art. And so it was kind of, you know, un, uncharted waters for someone in my family. And it was, it had to be kind of strange, but you got to love my parents, like, they went to those improv shows. Right. And if you can only imagine what a group of 13 year olds do during an improv show, oh, God. it's probably not the best. It's probably a nightmare, but it was, you know, that was kind of this, this like singular moment in my life because this teacher, Carol Rodden, uh, I'll never forget her. She was a life changer. I, I, uh, I, I get made fun of, and this was, this was Indiana, and I and I was, you know, in that point of being a a kid who felt really confused and depressed, and you know, and I had I had a lot of emotions, and I always say at that time I I had posters of Morrissey up, and I loved Morrissey and James Dean, maybe a little bit more than just a musician, you know. I I was you know mm-hmm. very I was you know effeminate, and I was you know I could, you know, just figuring things out like kids should do, and yeah. But it was on top of that, being in like a pretty, you know, typical school at that time. And the jocks or whatever you call them, who were my friends, started calling me bad names. And, yeah. you know, my, you know, I had 
gym teachers calling me faggot and just, you know, yeah. that kind of stuff. And I remember my teacher, uh, this Carol Rod, and she saw somebody call me that, and she grabbed me and took me over to the gym, and there was the kids doing wrestling practice. Mm-hmm. And she said, these are the same kids that just called you those bad names, and look at what they're doing to one another. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, I, and she said... And she just was there, you know, she kind of brought such a, man, she just really allowed me to feel, I haven't thought about Carol Rodden in 20 years, but she allowed me to be an artist and kind of started that thing to be, okay, you can, you can, you can discover all these things that you're thinking. And, you know, and it was through drama that, you know, I started playing music and I, I'd wanted to be a, I think I wanted to be a musician years before I knew how to play music. And I, Mm -hmm. I'd make comic books of these, these little characters called the nuclear warheads, very cold era, cold war era. And, uh, I'd make comic books of this punk band and I didn't know what punk music was, but I knew about Mohawks and I would, I would make, I would draw comics of them playing shows and meeting fans, you know, and then it was, and I would draw band logos on my notebook, and I, so I remember I got a, oh, what was it? It was like a, so this is, this is the, this is an entry-level guitar for you. I got a use, not ovation, but applause. Do you remember those guitars? Oh, yeah, it with was, the rounded back? Was, yes, yes. It was yeah. about two inches thick with pure plastic, and <laughs> I got an applause that probably cost 50 bucks, you know, from... Yeah from for a birthday or something and with the sound so hole I, that maybe isn't really a sound hole but just a bunch no. of loose holes near the top of the sound board. yeah i mean when people are looking at you know dreadnought martin from the world war ii era and they're talking about the you know the ivory bone uh inlays and you know the resonance that goes on for days uh this didn't have any of those so <laughs> it was but it did have the one cool thing it did have was a plug and I instantly, before I even learned chords, I plugged the guitar into my dad's tape machine, mm-hmm. and weirdly, kind of, uh, it was my, uh, I just forgot, Phil Spector moment. Uh, I plugged it in, and I realized if you push record, and then ran the tape player out to the hi-fi, mm-hmm. and ran the guitar into the tape player, and turned it all the way up, it would create distortion. <laughs> And it would create like a Sonic Youth, you know, level like saturation. That that's so interesting course, because you still away. to this day, like when I've heard demos of yours, or when you will just be talking on the phone about you getting ready for a new album. To this day, you still use tones and um, just timbres and different effects of an instrument to inspire songs. That's still to this day a um, a tool in your toolkit. Yeah, it's just been a, it was not knowing what things do and never being told how they work. So you discover how they work. And I, you know, and it was that wonderful way of learning how to play guitar, of learning a G chord, I remember. And then, uh, and I never, also another funny thing is I never had a, I broke the high E string right away Mm -hmm. and I had no idea how to change it. So for years I had, I didn't know how to finger chords with the high E string because I never had one. Right. I never, I, he, he still to this day, I look at this four and six string on my guitar. I was like, what do I do with this really thin one? I don't like this down here. So it was uh, more of just not knowing how to change strings, but yeah, you'd learn a G chord, but then you move your fingers up one fret and that didn't sound good. But then if you moved it up two frets, oh, it sounds good. And then see, I then love that just, mindset because you, what it means is that you're actually listening. And, you know, I've been playing piano for years, but I've never wanted to sit down and learn it formally because exactly. I listen I listen when I'm playing piano in a way that I can't when I'm playing guitar anymore because I'm too proficient yep. these days at playing guitar. And what you're talking about is sort of a beginner's mind of, let me just really listen to what's going on right now. And simple question, do I like the way this sounds, yes or no? And then... Yep. And it- Yeah, it's the magic of what, you know, and it still happens. I remember I, you know, especially with piano, I, I, again, very rudimentary, but 
you know, so I would I find new places to put my fingers, and I think I've discovered the center of the earth, you know, like the God cord or something, and it just is, you know, blowing my mind. And I had a um, a wonderfully talented uh, keyboard or pianist in my band, Eliza, and I remember at practice once I was like, oh, and then this part, Eliza, it's crazy, but I do this chord. And she's like, oh, that's just the diminished ninth. And I was like, oh, no, you just, you took this, you basically took this glowing sphere of sacred energy and just turned it into like a scale. And it was, you know, it was good to learn what a diminished ninth is, but I, I'd rather just remember it as like, you know, my crystal that I dug through the earth to find. Yeah, dude, they say that the reason babies are so, um, and young kids are so in the moment is that they're not yet filtering the world through language yet. And so yep. when, um, when you have a band member give you a name for that thing, all of a sudden you're thinking of the name rather than the feeling and, and yep. being in the moment with it. Fast forward from there, um, you leave Goshen, you go to school for a couple of years, you come back home to marry uh, a sweetheart, you get engaged, that is broken off, and you end up in all places of Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, and you start playing music. And you've described one of my favorite descriptions of yours of the early years of your career uh, were dimly lit mulled wine parties with Sandy Bull quietly, and I mean quietly, on the speakers. <laughs> and you've said, thinking about some of those early shows, I can understand why I lasted in that feels folk scene for so long. It's so fucking cozy. Your goal is to make living rooms feel like concerts, and concerts feel like living rooms. You put on some Christmas lights around your merch table to highlight your hand-numbered, hand-stamped CDRs. Tell me about that scene, both locally and and on a national level that you were a part of or aiming to be a part of, who else was in that, and what was the overall theme of it? It was. It started, uh, Strand of Oaks actually played their first show ever, uh, I think it was 2003, uh, and it was under the name Strand of Oaks, I'm pretty sure, And but the first show we ever played, was uh, a very early incarnation where I had a full-size church, Lowry, Oregon, <laughs> and I had Noam Ch This is for real, too. I, I had, it was uh, the era, I, I suppose, but I had, a, I had Noam Chomsky speeches taped, <laughs> and I would play those. I think it was him discussing 9-11, and I have those tapes playing... Well, I was playing kind of deep, droney organ, and then we had a drummer who sounded like Sunny Day Real Estate's drummer, and then a guitar player doing, like, uh, Mogwai riffs. And we uh, did something. We opened up for this neighbor of mine who is, a, like, a very, uh, very, very, like, uh, Jack Johnson-y singer-songwriter. Oh, yes. And he said, oh, you guys play music, open for us. Or you should open for me. We're like, sure, why not? And so that was the first show. But then about, you know, it was just kind of like we would go to parties. And uh, there was this one house in particular, my friend Dennis's house, where there was instruments set up. And I had just a very limited amount of songs. And I just, my friends that were there would pick up instruments. And then we decided to play a show. And... Uh, this was, and I feel really lucky, actually. I, I, I kind of was, it was a little harsh, you know, talking, you know, what you just read. I think I was, you know, in one of my phases at that point. But um, <clears throat> it was a kind of a beautiful time because I was, I was 21 in 2003, and that was kind of the birth of the freak folk movement of, you know, Devendra Banhart and uh, Joanna Newsom and a lot of those bands, early Animal Collectives, and oh, right. a lot of those, uh, oh, I forgot, I'm forgetting a lot of bands now, but, um, you know, it was a lot of collectives sort of thing. There was a lot of bands called that, I remember. But um, it was this kind of really neat uh, scene where a lot of people were rediscovering lost records. They were discovering Bill Fay. They were discovering Pearls Before Swine and, uh, uh, geez, too many. To, you know, there was the vendor that did this Golden Apples of the Sun comp, and it was 
beautiful, you know, Anthony the Johnsons. And so it was this really wonderful scene that I kind of fell into, along with like the microphone, uh, Mira and K Records. And so I started playing shows at this club, Cafe Metropolis, and we just opened for everybody mm -hmm. in, you know, a span of time. And we opened for all of these amazing bands. I, I think we even opened for Ted Leo once. And it was incredible. I mean, it was just one of the best shows ever. He played so long that he ran out of songs and just went up on stage and started playing, like, you know, MC5 covers on his stretch. It was mind-blowing oh. to be able to be there. But And it was just this kind of punk rock club where we as a band were always there and we never got paid, but we were just always in town. So we would open up for every band coming through. And, uh, we ended up opening for, uh, it's a, it's a great, great to think about, but we opened up a show where the roof caved in of cafe metropolis. So we ended up playing in the lobby of the venue with, uh, this band wolf colonel and, <laughs> And I, we still did a show to the four beautiful people that were there. And I met that night my friend Jason Anderson, who's my best friend in the entire world. You know, it's like you and my friend Christian and Jason. Like, that's my, those are my best friends. And I, I then played the show with Jason and then met, you know, him. And then we ended up being his backing band for a show in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. around 2004 and we met Kimia Dawson who was in uh she was in the Moldy Peaches before and uh mm -hmm. kind of a hero of the anti folk scene whatever that means I never got that tag at all mm -hmm. but anti folk whatever but so we met Kimia and then Kimia on a whim just said you guys should go on tour with me so we ended up going on tour as Strand of Oaks and then Jay Sanderson's backing band and then Kimya Dawson would play by herself. And we toured the States and then we toured England with Kimya for like a month. And it was, it was insane. It was, we had no idea what we were doing. Just, I had no idea how to stop songs or start them or tune my guitar really. I, I didn't know what monitors were <laughs> and how, what they did. I, it was just, you know, and then we were playing, you know, these really cool shows. And, and then with that happening, we started, you know, like my dream at that time was if Calvin Johnson could just please hear my K, record, like K records, K records. Yeah. K records, please. You know, because I love the K records. I love, you know, all of the bands on that label. And that to me was the, that was the label for me. You know, that was everything. And <clears throat> I also remember, I think it's a true story. It was, I, I, I say that now because I, my memory is going, but I remember sending my demo to Chris Swanson at Secretly Canadian. And he uh, called me, I think called me or t we had a mutual friend. And he said like, this is really good. Like, I'd love to talk to you down the road. And, mm -hmm. You know, it, you know, people that at the time it felt really really approachable you know yeah. i could meet these people and it was demo submission policies were a real thing yeah. and i uh then did the tour with kenya and then came back and real quick you know the really funny thing about getting an email back at that age for you from someone like uh secretly is when you're that age and you just get an email back from somebody in your mind, even if that email is just like, this sounds pretty good, man. I wish you the best of luck. In your mind, yeah. it's like, I just got a $50,000 offer from Secretly yeah. Canadian. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I just got the front page of Rolling Stone, like the yeah. front cover. Like, there it is. And, you know, and of course, because he put out Songs of Haya and Jason Molina. That right. Was, you know, it's so cool to me, but... On Christmas Eve, 1906, a Canadian scientist named Reginald Fessenden used a microphone and a transmitter to alter popular culture forever. That night, radio operators aboard ships in the Atlantic, accustomed to hearing only the mechanical dots and dashes of Morse code, were blindsided with a different sound entirely, music. The momentary confusion 
of a few sailors upon hearing a solitary violin play, O Holy Night, was a small price to pay for the birth of a new medium. Americans everywhere soon began sending their voices out into the air, hoping that someone, anyone, would hear them. Tea merchants announced their latest arrivals from the Far East. Doctors shilled elixirs and tonics, and amateur DJs played music. Not unlike the technology we're struggling to absorb today, radio disrupted contemporary society and culture at the time. Suddenly, jazz, blues, and gospel were invisibly sailing over the red lines of segregated black communities. And while some white Americans saw that as a threat to the pre-civil rights social order, corporate giants like GE and RCA saw it as big business. So radio as we know it today was here to stay. And it would allow music to graduate from an array of local vernaculars into full-on common languages spoken across the country and the world. A young Italian kid from Detroit could listen to Charlie Parker on his shortwave radio and go on to become a member of the Motown Records house band. A young Jamaican kid could hear the American doo-wop of the Drifters on the few stations strong enough to cross the Gulf of Mexico and then go on to imbue his native reggae with a sense of melody it had never known before. And, more humbly, a kid from Goshen, Indiana, could glimpse a whole musical world beyond the horizons of Elkhart County. When Tim was coming of age, terrestrial radio was still all-powerful. Two of his most defining songs, Radio Kids and Goshen 97, are love letters to the airwaves that invisibly delivered a whole world of music to his small-town doorstep, leaving him forever changed. The single from the last album, Goshen 97, and the single from the latest one, Radio Kids, have something in common, and see if, if you can stick with me on this. Both of them are kind of, in their own ways, odes to not only terrestrial radio, but odes to a time when there was less of a splintering and specificity in musical taste, when there was more of like a monoculture that was shared by a great many people. Why do you find that to be a subject, that bygone time of uh, musical consensus? What do you think you find so appealing about that, and why do you continue to write about it? I, I think I got, I think I got lazy with Radio Kids. I, I didn't even realize until it was done that I, I, my first verse and second verse followed the same exact pattern as Goshen. Oh man, that was a, that was a, <laughs> couldn't spend a little more time on that. But it is, it is a, it is a scenario that I, I'm drawn to, and you know because I, I, I have this constant. Uh, lack of place that I find where I was not old enough to experience Lollapalooza the first right. time around. I couldn't be there and, you know, be doing, you know, I, I couldn't be like doing drugs and watching, you know, Babes in Toyland or, you know, I, yeah. I was too young, but I could see it and I could be the spectator of, of the 90s. And mm -hmm. I was, I, it just looked like, you know, when Indiana Jones finds the chalice, it was this, you know, sacred, sacred feeling that, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to be a few years older and be there when Eddie would sing even flow. You know, I, I, I just wasn't old enough. So there's always this sense of wishing I was, could have been a part of that. And, but at, at, in reality, I was just a fan and I was, Mm -hmm. I felt, I felt as though it was, you know, I didn't have, I didn't share those records with other people. I just had that world to myself, similar to how I make music. And that was a really beautiful time in the midst of a lot of bad times being a teenager. 
Yeah. That was my favorite time. And that was that was the few slivers of joy that I had and kind of a tough tough go at it for a bit and I find that a lot and I find that is you know, I find it tempting and it is very tempting and I, I we both need to be careful about this to sound like the old guys mm-hmm. and wagging fingers at what is going on right now because I feel fucking younger at 34 than I did at 24. Yeah. I feel I feel so much more relevant to the world. I was now. so much older then. I'm younger than that now. You know exactly. And I feel as though I'm, you know, just more more okay with who I am. But it is there is something that we are going to lose, and we're going. And this is my small wagging the finger moment. Like if you have everything, you could end up with nothing. Mm-hmm. And what is what is left when you are just needing to be stimulated and your attention spans get shortened, shortened and shortened and shortened. And I wonder, you know, are we in 20 years, are we just going to have 30 second long songs where the bass drops and the chorus hits like, and then it's over just so you can get that quick moment of like, you know, our songs going to be written for Instagram length videos. I, you know, it's just, yeah. When people, yeah, people there, are talking there will about be that progression. There will be that for certain listeners of music, but I mean that will be the same people that were listening to uh, Millie Vanilli in the '90s, and the same people yeah. who are listening to uh, who are listening to you know Jonas Brothers in the early 2000s. I mean, there's always going to be exactly that, but alongside of that, there's always been um, there's always been your Miles Davises, there's always been the Smiths, there's yeah. always been uh, Elliot Smith, there's always been um, a home. It, it's just that I think there was this beautiful moment um, that was so attractive to us when we were kids that we could look up and say, wow, the pop culture at large and kind of the monoculture is is celebrating. Nirvana was a pretty artistic thing to be celebrating as an entire culture, you know, and a, yeah. uh, and I would stand by that. I, I'd even stand by, and I know for a fact that you would stand by the fact that Smashing Pumpkins was that too. Um, yeah, that oh, it, but also let's just let's just put the record. Fuck Billy Corgan at this point. That guy <laughs> is just Alex Jones. I mean, dude, you won. You made a million dollars. Like I, oh god, I, I I'm regretting my fandom of that band every. I'm like, you know, your your heroes always become villains. Yeah. He is just fulfilling that prophecy more and more and more. I want to <laughs> shift my history a little bit more and be like, actually, I was a giant Pearl Jam fan. Eddie <laughs> yeah. Vedder continues to impress me as my life gets older. And I, no, but anyways, I, yeah. you know, and I think it, it was, you know, it was a different time, but I, I love records now, you know, and I love... I, I love records now more than ever, and I'm getting on a complete tangent. What, what do your music habit? What do your music listening habits look like these days? These days, it's just I. It's like you keep pulling back. The, I keep pulling back the curtain, and I want to find the truest center of things. So I want to find like what is the most like. What is the what is the heaviest doom metal record? What is the most uh, most perfect dub mix? You know, what is the perfect King Tubby mix? Mm-hmm. I you know it, it's very it's very searching. And honestly, I think the things that impress me the most are non uh, Euro Western based music necessarily. Mm-hmm. Like you know the idea of you know. For every for every you know funk band we've heard for years, there was a band in Nigeria probably doing it a thousand times better that just never got out of Nigeria. Right. And then you know, and then you can hunt down these amazing re-releases and you know this world of you know this you know this. For instance, there's this guy William Onyebauer. He passed away recently, but he was making synthesizer music in the seventies. Wow. That sounded like Fela Kuti and Kraftwerk had a baby. And it was just of another world. And 
and maybe that's what I'm, I'm now I'm just interested in people who create utopias within their own world of a record. And that can be with Gillian and Dave Rollins. You know, it, it can be right. with, you know, Revelator. It can be with, you know, Moon Duo. It can be with, you know, it can be with the National. You know, I, I love, I love records that are, are still focused on, like, nothing else but creating that, building an entire planet where you can be in Google Earth and see the whole planet, but then you can keep zooming and keep zooming in further and further until yeah. you see, like, the street and then the car on the street and the person in the car. And there's records, you know, that are still put out like that. Not as many. I've, it, especially recently, I've, I've been hunting. I've not been able to find a lot of, like, brand new bands that are doing that. I hope they... Maybe it's just a growth process, but you know, there's there's bands like King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard that are doing that, which I love. Mm -hmm. But um yeah, it's just that world of it goes back to, you know, pet sounds and the Beatles of you know, mm -hmm. within this one perfect encapsulated moment, you know, forty minutes, an hour, you yeah. have this this planet to live on. You're looking for records that have an internal logic to themselves that's yeah. kind of consistent, whether you like that logic yeah. or not. You know. Yeah, and I think you know, look at it as simple as like when Springsteen in Nebraska. Right. That is a culture. Even the tape hit is part of the culture of that record. Right. And the weird distant mandolins, and you know, and I, it doesn't have to be a Pink Floyd record to make that happen. And I just, I get really. And then on the flip side, I get very frustrated by genre. I get extremely frustrated by people who love to live within a label of, right. all right, you know, we're, you know, my biggest complaint with a lot of things with like the folk music side, it's like, this just sounds like you went to a clinic mm -hmm. and learned how to do this and they just did it again and then you're doing it again. And right. I understand the tradition of passing along like a bluegrass riff or whatever, but it's, it's like, look towards certain artists, and they do within that spectrum. Again, like, I, I will never think that a better or more perfect record could be Re Revelator. I think that's the perfect, it's the most perfect record I've ever heard with two people and two instruments. Gillian never Welch's, ever. Gillian Welch's Yeah, Gillian Welch's. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, I Dream a Highway is, I've written journal after journal about that, getting stoned and understanding that. And mm -hmm. that is a perfect example of what happens when people aren't, you know, she's not, you know, she could have easily made terrible decisions on that record of like putting in like, you know, laptop beats and trying to make, you know, like some, you know, like she could have made timely decisions of like pro tools tricks right. or whatever. And, but why does that record sound like the future? And yeah. why don't more bands sound like the future when it comes to those stands? first time I met Tim, we were on a marathon eight-week tour of the States, and a typical day might look like this. You're playing Minneapolis on Friday and Chicago on Saturday, so you arrive in Minneapolis after a nine-hour drive because you played St. Louis the night before. You load in, you sound check, you tactfully suggest that the house engineer dial back the reverb with a five-second tail. He gets pissed and just runs your voice entirely dry for the rest of the night. At that point, you chase down the promoter's rep and you get buyouts or meal tickets for the band. They leave to eat hot garbage somewhere and you spend the next hour counting in merchandise inventory and setting up a guest list. At 10.30, you take the stage and the next 75 minutes are great because 
it's Minneapolis and it's Friday night and the local station started playing your song a few times a week. You sell merch for an hour, wrap the gear, load the van, and head out to the country inn and suites by the airport that you booked on Priceline. At 2 a.m., though, you're the last guests to arrive for the night, so the two rooms you've booked only have king beds in them. You share a bed with the bass player for a few hours of sleep and wake up at 6 a.m. when the alcohol wears off. Van call is 7.30 because... Chicago is six hours away, but somehow it always takes eight. If you're lucky, it's your day to sleep on the back bench next to the suitcases on the drive. If you're not lucky, you're at the wheel or, worse yet, sandwiched into the middle seat. You arrive at the club in Chicago, meet the promoter who's not happy about presale, and the whole process starts again. Keep in mind that at that point, you've already done this for a month on the East Coast, and you're about to spend another month doing it on the West Coast. By the time we arrived home from that tour, my wife saw my face and thought that I had jaundice. When you tour that much, you really begin to appreciate the creature comforts and familiarity of being at home. Tim makes his home in Philadelphia, but feels like he knows less about that city than, say, New York or San Francisco, because when he's home, he doesn't stray too far from the nest. Fifteen years ago, I can remember taking a trip to New York City and... A friend had just moved there, and they were living in Brooklyn at the time. And 15 years ago, I didn't even know what Brooklyn was. I basically had no idea until I crossed the bridge, and she was living in the McKibben Street lofts in Williamsburg, and she had a job as a weed courier. There were all these people in bands living in these lofts. It was the, it was what I had always imagined a city to be like when I was a kid. But because of the way money works, um, Brooklyn is not that place anymore because no place can remain that. And a lot of outsider artists have moved. A lot of them have moved to Philadelphia. And uh, you've been there for about a decade now already. You were ahead of the curve. How has Philadelphia shaped you and shaped your music? I, it's... Philadelphia is is defined by a lot of things in my life. I mean, most importantly, above the music, it, it is where I live, and it's where Sue and I and my wife have lived. And, you know, we've lived most of our married life here in the same apartment in this really nice neighborhood out of the way. Because we live probably 45, half an hour, 45 minutes drive outside the city. Yeah. But Philly is so big that we're still in Philadelphia city limits. So I never, like, I, I've always had this kind of push-pull relationship with the city because I love being at home so much. And my neighborhood and my coffee shop and my little microcosm because I always have this joke, like, on tour, every night you're in that street in that neighborhood of that city with the... You know, with the specialty cocktails and the Todd whatever. Snyder. It's Todd like, Snyder calls it something to do street. Yeah, something to do street. I call it Sesame Street. Often, <laughs> it, just, it just looks the fucking same everywhere you go. But you know, it's just I'm I do those every night as a musician, and I want to go to the grocery store, and you know, like and like be with you know be with my wife on a walk, and like you know I. I randomly will go to this bird watching tower near my place and try and learn about hawks. And, you know, I, so Philadelphia offers all of these amazing places. And I just am never a part of it. I <laughs> socially, my impact in Philadelphia is zero because I, I, I wonder if people even know that they don't know I live here until they, they have to just find me walking along the street. You One know, thing I my, will give you, we, we talk on the phone about, once a month and pretty like every other time that I call you, uh, I'll be like, where are you at, man? You're like, well, I'm just, uh, I'm about an hour into a walk right now. Yeah. <laughs> I got about three hours left. So I got time to talk. You are pretty reliably just, 
going on some pretty, you know, five, six mile walks every time I talk to you. There's like a 90% chance I'm walking. Yeah. I, I just, I, I think it's a, it's one of my favorite things to do. I, I, I love to walk and talk to my friends and, mm -hmm. you know, call you and, you know, whatever the weather is, I, I still wear my vest in the summer, but I have that with like cut off Daisy Dukes. I look ridiculous, but I just my thing. But, um, yeah, I, you know, and then when it goes back to Philly, you know, that's, I love my little apartment, you know, my home here, but as a city, you know, stepping out from my personal life and then as music life, I have seen Philadelphia go from, you know, 2008, I don't remember exactly, but I played a new club called Johnny Brendan. Right. And, and before that, it was always Sean Agnew, R5, the first Unitarian Church. Mm -hmm. And I actually moved to Philadelphia shortly in 2001. So I was, you know, here all the way back then. But, um, you know, I saw it as this kind of like, I always felt really upset that people considered it like a stopover town. Or not, not a stopover, what do you call it? Like when you, when you, when you pass by it, it's like a it was New York and D.C., mm -hmm. you know, like, and... And then I just started seeing the city, you know, and it's a key factor to have an amazing city. And I'll get a little businessy right now for mm -hmm. if cities want to do it right. They need to have two things. A, they need to have a good radio station. Hell yeah. And, and we have WXPN, and they're not just a good station. They're a station that takes local bands yes. and actually does a very focused effort to not make them just local sensation. You know, right. this isn't like so-and-so biggest fan. Like, Philadelphia and x Fan, what they do is, that's why you've heard of so many Philadelphia bands, because they'll take these local bands and not just create this insecure capsule of, like, you know, the biggest rock band in Philly. They make everybody know about that band. And yes. You know, and just this super supportive structure of why am I being, you know, it's early on, like, why the hell am I on the radio? Like, yeah. I can't even bring five people into my clubs, but, you know, they're playing bands and especially young bands. And so we have that. Yeah. And, and the other, I mean, there's only, there's probably a handful of those stations in the country that do that for their local artists. Yeah. The current in Minneapolis does that for KEXP. KEXP. Uh, um, WFUV in New York. I mean, yeah, there's, there's, yeah. Th there's some bastions of light that are amazing. And I, you know, and I think that's so important for a scene. And the other thing that was essential for Philadelphia is, uh, you know, for, I call it the step up situation okay. where you start building venues so bands can progress naturally. Right. And, you know, now we have, uh, a club, Boot and Saddle, that's like 200 people, I think, 150, 200 people, and a band can work to open there than to sell that out. Mm -hmm. And then there's just a, a very natural step up to another club that's maybe 300 people. Right. And then there's like a 400. And, and you can just keep growing because what happens, and it's not the town's fault, but you'll play... You'll play a city, and there's that punk 100-cap club. And the next thing is a 650-cap room where <laughs> I can't even at this point sell out, you know, right. in like a smaller city. So it's like, how? what the hell do you do? And especially for a local band. And, you know, and New York has that. Because, you know, New York, New York, what was it always? Like the Mercury Lounge, then moving up to ba you know, like to Bowery. Really cool yeah. growth system. Austin has it. Chicago has it. Seattle. You were talking when you were first describing Philadelphia, kind of making a distinction between, you know, your private life there and then your public life playing music. And what I'd like to close on today kind of touches on that. The narrative of your last record was really centered around marital discord that you had. Um, and then since then, I've been reading a few of your interviews for this latest one. And you've mentioned that, uh, opening up publicly about your private life was one of your biggest regrets. And where do you see yourself going forward 
as far as opening up your private self uh, to the public sphere? I, I have to be more protective. I, just like when I make records, there's not a good filtration device. Mm-hmm. You know, coffee doesn't taste good if you just drop the beans in the water. <laughs> right. Like, you know, you gotta, you, you gotta have something in between there. And, you know, I like strong coffee and I like strong conversation, but I just have, I have a flaw of just my mouth doesn't stop moving. And I, I get, I get excited to talk and then I, I, I get impulsive to speak and I never, I never say anything that's not true, but as my mom always said, like, I would catch a fish and it would be like a three inch bluegill and I had just caught Moby Dick. Like <laughs> I, I was holding the shark from Jaws, like in my mind and it's not me lying. It's just, that's how I think about things. And, you know, yeah. I, I, as far as like emotional you know, as far as playing guitar solo, that's fine. I'm going to never have a filter. I'm going to go out there and never change that. But there is a sacred element that I, I kind of, I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't careful with. And obviously when it comes to press, they're looking for blood. Like they sure. want the best byline you've ever read. And they want a, you know, a feud or something like that. And I, I just, I think I was feeling a lot of things, and I don't, I don't ever, I don't, I don't ever want to talk about my marriage ever, ever. Yeah. I don't want, I don't want to, I, I wish that would be just, it's fine, people, I guess now people think I'm a drug addict or something like that, but I'm not, <laughs> I just like to party, but it is, you know, I, you know, I, I, that's fine if it's my own shit. You know, focus on that. That's yeah. great. But there is, unless, and I'm going to have a rule, like, unless, if you want to ask me that question, you're not going to ask me, you're going to ask my wife. Sure. And then she will answer it probably a lot more honestly. And, you know, and it's just a matter of protecting that more. And and I'm still going to write autobiographical songs, but, yeah, I even yeah. with this one, you know, I'm still... I'm still dealing with those repercussions and it's just not something I want to. And until Sue makes a record, which would probably be amazing. <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't, it's not, it's not, it's not anybody else's business, I guess. And, and I need to say that to myself going into interviews now yeah. and, you know, actually stop people. I've, and I've had interviewers, you know, like I've had interviews just like, dead on the line because I, you know, especially towards the end of Heal when I, you know, had more people asking, you know, stories of suddenly I'd gotten divorced three times or something, right. or, you know, was homeless for a year. I don't know how it happened, but, yeah. you know, I, you know, I, I would just like simply stop interviews and say, we need to change the question or we can't, I'm not going to talk about this anymore. Like I've given yeah. enough I've given enough juicy details to the detriment of the woman that I love. And Yeah, and people will really take it and run. I remember the best example I can think of is doing an interview with someone for one of my first records, and we're on the phone, and they go, so do you basically, you walk around and you notice things, and then you turn your life into a song, huh? And I said, no, not really. And they were like, well, you don't walk around? And I was like, yeah, I guess I walk around. They were like, do you notice things? I'm like, yeah, I guess I notice things. They're like, do you end up putting some of those things in a song? I'm like, yeah, I guess I do. Fast forward a month later, and the article, like, the headline is Joe Pug, a guy that walks around, notices things, and puts them into songs. Exactly. <laughs> You're like, and God, you know, fucking damn it, man. I, I, You know, I ever since then, I've just been... I, I'm probably too much in the other direction. I, I yeah. never I never want to give any fucking personal details whatsoever. Yeah. Um just because I, I feel like it can be taken out of context big time and I feel like uh I, I feel like people really don't need it to enjoy um the output of the work. You know, I, I wish I could take, you know, folk 
music and discuss my problems with Sue and change her to the winding river or something <laughs> like that, or the, you know, the, the, the dark skies above the yeah. Idaho plain or something like that. You know, I, no, I just talk about my fucking fight that I have with my wife yeah. and it's out there, but brother, it's so good to talk to you, man. It's been too long. It's been way too long, but yeah, this is a, uh, Needless to say, I, I would, you know, everyone's claiming like I was the first person to love, you know, Bleached when it came out. Mm -hmm. I, I will very, I'll go to bat and say I was the first mega fan of the working songwriter. I, I sent I you the you MP3. Attest to that. Yeah, yeah I, I sent was, you of the first episode. I, I like sent it to you in a Dropbox file to see what you thought of it. I remember that. Yeah, and it was amazing. I just am. I'm gonna throw it back to you for the listeners. I am, as a friend, extremely proud of you. And I think this is, you know, in the catalog of work, it, you know, just as Joni Mitchell painted pictures, you know, the beautiful paintings, like, this is just it's just part of your catalog I view it as. And it made me appreciate you, even though I talk to you all the time, like, it made me appreciate you and respect you that much more, so... Uh, well, is, uh, at least very cool we, thing that you're doing. we made it all all the way to the end before you deflected the attention and approbation onto me. So I'll but take, I got it in. But you got it in. Um, and man. you're not editing that out either. So hey, uh, I will not edit that part out. Uh, That's our show for this month. Thanks for listening. Strand of Oak's latest album is Hard Love. Available everywhere, digital music is sold or streamed. Today's episode was engineered and mixed by Matt Schusler. It was written by myself and Paul Barbagallo. If before we meet again, you sit down to write, please remember, an expensive pair of jeans is not a song. A compelling Instagram account is not a song. And most importantly, reverb is not a song. So let all that take care of itself. And for you, just keep your eye on the song. <laughs>